Okay. A uh, couple things. I'm a geophysicist by trade. I've worked in the mining industry, and for the last 34 years, I worked either with or for the U.S. Geological Survey in their geomagnetism program. Uh, I've got a Ph.D. Uh, in geophysics from the School of Mines. Uh, my thesis research was in magnetospheric physics. Unfortunately, I am not an ionospheric physicist. Uh, and so I'm going to try and educate people about the Earth's magnetic field and a few other things. And there we go. Uh, so I'm going to be talking about the magnetic field of the Earth, or it's also called the geomagnetic field. I'm going to tell you a bit about magnetic observatories and what the USGS and its predecessors have been doing for the last 123 years. And then I'm going to finish up talking about K indices, uh, trying to dispel a few misconceptions that are in some of the manuals by ARRL and introduce some new indices, which I think that uh, 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 we as hams may find more useful. And if you have questions, just please let me know. So, uh, for the outline, uh, I'm going to go over some very basic electromagnetic physics. Uh, then I'm going to talk about the magnetic field of the Earth, uh, the pro uh, an overview of the USGS program, uh, a little bit on equipment develop and development, and then finally finishing up with activity indices. So the basics. Uh, the electric and magnetic fields, as a lot of you may already know, are interrelated. Uh, an electric current will create a magnetic field, that's Ampere's law. A magnetic field that changes with time will create an electrical current in a conductive body, that's Faraday's law. And these, are re these relationships and two other equations are explained by Maxwell's equations, which require a knowledge of differential and integral calculus and is beyond the scope of this presentation. Uh, I, I figure if I went into the calculus, everyone would probably drop off fairly quickly. Okay, so an idealized version of the magnetic field is seen on the left, uh, where the magnetic field of the Earth is basically represented by a bar magnet, and it's essentially a dipole field uh, where the... Uh, Actually, somehow or another, the north end is in the south pole and the south end is in the north pole. Uh, blame that on Benjamin Franklin. Uh, with the magnetic field, uh, we, it's a vector component. And so on the right-hand side, you can see how everything is oriented. We have the H field, which uh, or horizontal component, which points to magnetic north, not, ge not geographical north. And that angle between those two is the declination value. The inclination value is the angle from horizontal. There is an east component and an up-down component. Uh, the field strength amplitude is about 25 to 60,000 nanoteslas. On average, it's about 50,000 nanoteslas or half a gauss. Uh, we work in nanoteslas uh, in my field because uh, those are the kind of variations we see. So the magnetic field of the Earth has four parts to it. There's the internal or main field, the local or crustal field, the external field, and the induced field. And all of these play a part in what you see uh, if you have a compass or a magnetometer on the surface of the Earth. Now, the internal or main field is the largest component of the magnetic field, of the Earth's magnetic field. And it's like 80 to 90 percent of it or more. It's generated in the Earth's core by a dynamo process. Uh, 
I don't know if it could ever be stopped like the movie, The Core, but uh, we're, we've got our fingers crossed. And when you're using a compass on the surface of either the Earth, that's what you're largely measuring, is you're looking at the main field. Now, the crustal field is one of the weaker ones. Uh, it's actually the magnetic field within the crust of the Earth, within the rocks. And uh, it's basically caused by remnant magnetization, <laughs> excuse me, remnant magnetization in rocks, usually igneous rocks, where it's like a basalt flow in Hawaii uh, cools off and all the iron or ferrous minerals in there align with the magnetic field of the Earth. Uh, in addition, uh, in, say, a sandstone or a shale, there could be little bits of uh, magnetite that has settled in there, and they might show a magnetic character. Another cause of this are lightning strikes, where you might have a peak, a, mount, a small or large mountain peak that gets repeatedly struck by lightning, and each lightning strike can rearrange the minerals uh, the magnetic minerals in there, and it can sometimes create a rather sizable anomaly that uh, will dissipate, you know, you know, 50 feet away. Uh, the external field is sort of my area of interest. It's very complex. It's caused when the uh, Earth's magnetic field the interplanetary magnetic field and the solar wind all collide sort of out in front of the Earth. Uh, you can get some very small amplitudes to very large amplitudes. And you can see the effects of this in what are called magnetic storms, the northern lights. Uh, and you get uh, there are also a lot of smaller pulsations in the magnetic field uh that uh are of varying amplitudes and they can cause a variety of space weather as aspects uh and even in a quiescent when in the, when the earth magnetic field is in a quiescent state you can still get a lot of very interesting things going on which uh fascinate the various researchers around the world now, finally, there's the induced field, and these are the result of the magnetic fields generated in the Earth's crust that are induced by the external fields. And these are most prominently seen in north-south pipelines and power lines, and a few other, you know, conductors of note. Uh, the fields in the power lines can create electrical damage or damage in electrical grids. Uh, in 1989, there was a magnetic storm that knocked out a, an entire substation and a bunch of other equipment in Quebec. And it also affected some places in uh, uh, New Jersey and New York. Uh, and these are known as geoelectric hazards. And actually, in the USGS, there's an ongoing program where they are evaluating these hazards. And it's in part a function of the conductivity of the Earth in the area. And in a very resistive, in very resistive rocks, uh, the hazards can be quite high. And that is the case up and down, or at least in the northern part of the East Coast. So, you know, every places from about Washington on north are very vulnerable to some of these problems. And one of the unfortunate things is that if it were to blow a equipment in a substation or a big power station, equipment like that costs millions of dollars to replace and they're not made readily. And a lot of power companies may only have one or two spares. And if 50 in the country get knocked out, it's going to be a while until the electrical grid will be back. Uh, and I'm talking, it will be back up. And I'm not talking, you know, like six months. It's more like three to six years. 
Now, this is a more realistic idea of the magnetic field of the Earth. It's This is a rather famous cartoon, and it's all foreshortened so that, you know, everything's compressed together. But what you can see here is that the Earth's magnetic field, which are in the kind of the light blue-green lines, is compressed by the pressure from the solar wind and the magnetic field of the sun. And that's how it works. Uh, anytime there's some sort of a solar uh, prominence or uh, any sort of a coronal mass ejection, something like that, if it hits the Earth, it can create all kinds of problems in the magnetic field. Now, the important thing to understand is the Earth's magnetic field shields the planet from harmful radiation and other aspects from the sun. But when there's a magnetic storm, that field is compressed and it allows a lot of energy to uh, flow down to Earth, especially at the north and south uh, poles. And these disturbances can cause many different effects on or around the Earth. Uh, this is just a sample of the effects. It can, uh, it can affect uh, satellites in orbit, uh, creating more drag, which will help degrade their orbits, or uh, <clears throat> you can, it can damage components. I mean, most satellites have what are known as hardened components in there. Uh, which, you know, it's not like your regular op amp you can go out and buy and stick into your thing here. It's a, it's something that costs maybe 10 times as much and is designed to resist uh, uh, such a, uh, things like protons hitting it or other uh, spurious magnetic fields. And sometimes satellites can outright fail. Uh, for astronauts, there's the radiation danger, danger, and also for any flights that go over the pole. Uh, I, we all know about the disruption of radio communications, especially in HF. Uh, since it can affect uh, satellites, it can degrade the accuracy of GPS. Uh, as I've mentioned before, it can induce currents in power lines and electrical systems. Uh, for anyone who's trying to do a geophysical survey, it can, you know, changes in the magnetic field can uh, be a nuisance. And also, uh, you know, a lot of the oil companies now use directional drilling, drilling that is guided by uh, magnetometer data that sometimes they collect or they get from us or whatever, and during a storm where the uh, field is changing very rapidly, it can create errors. Now, to combat all this stuff I'm telling you, uh, we, uh, you know, at the USGS and other agencies around the world, we do magnetic measurements. We measure the total field F, which has both a magnitude and direction as it is time dependent. It's a vector. Uh, everything is uh, reference to the horizontal reference plane, the true north meridian plane, and we have some nuclear magnetometers that are reference to the proton gyromagnetic ratio. Now, we set up magnetic observatories, and these are located in relatively benign sites. You know, 100, 120 years ago, it was very easy to find sites where there was no culture, no noise. Uh, <clears throat> it's now a lot harder because as society has expanded, it's harder and harder to find places that have are free of any influences uh, with a 600-foot radius or a little larger. Um, <clears throat> all the buildings at an observatory are pretty much constructed of non-magnetic materials. So that means no steel nails or any ferrous uh, products. Uh, and some of them are getting harder to find, but, you know, when we build them, we have to use uh, copper nails, aluminum nails, and the last 
10 or 15 years, the marine environment has developed silica bronze screws, which fit it into a screw gun, and they are mostly non-magnetic. Uh, uh, all the actual magnetometer sensors are in temperature-controlled environments. Uh, so, you know, at high latitudes, we can, it, uh, at high latitudes where it's, you know, you're running into Arctic weather, all you have to do is heat it to about 68, and it stays constant pretty much the year round. At some of our uh, low latitude observatories, such as Puerto Rico and Guam, all you have to do is air condition it to about 65, 68, and everything's fine. Actually, we a little warmer than that. Uh, it's in the mid latitudes, such as here in Boulder or some of the other places, where you have to heat it in the wintertime and cool it in the summertime, and that's a real challenge. And what we've learned to do is to actually place the HVAC plant about 200 feet away and duct the warm or cool air into the non-magnetic building. Uh, we use a three-axis magnetometer, which uh, records the north, south, east, west, and up, down, or vertical axes. Uh, we also uh, have a, I didn't mention it here, but it's a total field instrument which measures the actual magnitude or strength of the magnetic vector. And we also perform absolute measurements of the magnetic field to calibrate the output of uh, the flux gate magnetometer. Because the flux gate mag magnetometer is a, what do you call it? <laughs> the name... It's, um, no, it's a relative instrument. It doesn't give you a full field value. It just gives you outputs of voltage, which you can convert to magnetic, uh, magnetic field strength. And then you need calibration measurements so you can publish the data as full field values. Uh, these are a couple of the instruments you, we use. On the left-hand side, we have a flux gate magnetometer. It's actually in a suspension system. Uh, all of our magnetometers are placed on large concrete piers. Uh, they're fairly massive. Some of them go anywhere from 8 to 16 feet deep into the earth. And it's non-magnetic concrete. And... But we found that even the more massive ones, they can tilt with time. And I'm kind of talking time scales on the order of years. And so the sensor, which is towards the bottom, is suspended in such a way that it's auto leveling. Uh, on the right side is the instrument we use to measure the absolute values. It's a non-magnetic surveyor's theodolite with a flux, a single axis flux gate on the top of the telescope. And we use it to measure the declination angle and the inclination angles. Uh, and we com uh, combine that with, uh, what do you call, uh, absolute measurements from the total field sensor, which uh, can then give us, help us define the entire vector and then we can use it to uh, calibrate the data out of the flux gate magnetometer. Uh, here's two of our observatories. The one on the right is in Barrow, Alaska. Everything is pretty much in a single building except for an office about 400 feet away. And we make use of fiber optic technology so that all the data collection equipment is actually inside that building and everything is shot via network over to the other building where it then gets distributed to the world uh, via the internet. Uh, San Juan, P Puerto Rico is one of our older observatories. It's instead of having a single building, it's got, uh, you can see at least five buildings there and there's another one or two hidden in the trees. Uh, 
two completely different environments that the one for Barrow, Alaska, that's as far north as you can get in Alaska. It is in that's a summertime picture. Wintertime pictures don't come out too well because it's dark <laughs> and white. Uh, now, just north of town here, we have the Boulder Magnetic Observatory. It's located on North Table Mountain, north of Boulder. Uh, it's a NOAA controlled site with limited access. So, you know, people just can't drive up there and take a look at it. Uh, there's a lot of other experiments run by NOAA personnel where they're using lasers, doing uh, other RF uh, experiments and things like that. It was, the observatory was established in 63. In addition, it also record into the magnetic data, it also records the north, south, and east, west electric fields, which are in part being used to determine the conductivity, the conductivity of Earth at the site. And it's a uh, data of interest to many people in the uh, geomagnetic community. We also, it's, it's our test facility and we have a large coil calibration facility which we use to test and calibrate magnetometers. Uh, this is not the best picture, but it shows you, you know, you're up on a, on a table mountain there and everything's pretty well flat and, uh, you know, our equipment are housed in a number of different buildings there. Uh, and then this is our uh, coil facility. And you'll see there's two people inside there for scale. And so these are very large coils. Uh, they're also very heavy. Uh, they're square coils because square coils are easier to construct than round coils. And with computers now, computing the magnetic field from square coils is relatively easy. Uh, just for reference, what's in the foreground there on the tripod, that's the actual sensor for a total field uh, magnetometer. Uh, now, this is the network of observatories uh, by the USGS. You can see they're all over the United States, stretching from Guam to San Juan and as far north as Barrow. There's two errors in this thing. It's, this is an older picture. Del Rio Observatory in Texas was closed about 12, 15 years ago. Uh, and it doesn't show the observatory. It's about a hundred odd, or a couple hundred miles to the east of Barrow at Prudhoe Bay. That's part of a public private uh, partnership with Schlumberger. And we provide the data from, for them, and they feed it into their own magnetic models, which are proprietary, and they use that for directional drilling uh, in, up on the North Slope. Now, I've talked about magnetic storms a little bit, and this is a pretty interesting graph. This is data from Honolulu and College, Alaska. Now, what you need to know, and this covers about four days, something like that. And what you, it looks at first glance, it looks like the Honol the data from Honolulu uh, looks a little more active. But when you look at the vertical scales, you'll see that the scale for College, Alaska, that's in Fairbanks, is ten times larger than the scale for Hawaii which means, you know, there's a whole lot more variation at higher latitudes than at lower latitudes. And, you know, the magnetic, the knowledge of the magnetic field in the northern half of Alaska is very important to uh, a lot of people, including uh, pilots, because every plane is required to have a backup compass and, you know, if their GPS unit decides to choke on them or something like that, they can use the compass, but they need to have up-to-date... Uh, well, yeah, up-to-date uh, declination values. 
which are available online. Uh, and this is for the same period, but this is this is for Barrow. Every observatory has a three-letter ID, and Barrow is BRW. What's notable about this graph is this is the declination component in degrees, and there is almost a 10-degree difference. Actually, no. Yeah, about a, a little more than a 10-degree difference. 20 degree difference, excuse me, uh, between the high and the low during that period. And even, you know, when you look on the 29th, when you're away from that big spike, it's still rattling around by about four to six, ne uh, four to six degrees, which means that compass needle is just vibrating like there's no tomorrow. And it's, you know, this is a pretty dramatic picture, and it kind of shows that, you know, why it's necessary that we keep track of this, especially for, uh, you know, in places like Alaska. And this is a similar issue you see in all of the high latitude observatories, ranging from northern, you know, northern Alaska, northern Canada, northern Greenland, <coughs> and other places. And similarly, at very southern, southerly uh, observatories in and around Antarctica. Did someone have a question? Guess not. Okay, now, the USGS has had a geomagnetism program. Uh, I want to say it started in the late 19th century with the mission of collecting data to produce uh charts and models for navigational purposes. It was originally part of the coast and U.S. Coast and Geodetic Survey. Uh, but after a number of agency changes and 120 years later, it's now operated by the U.S. Geological Survey. Uh, there's a whole sordid tale of how that all happened, but I'll spare you the details. <clears throat> Uh, and, you know, for a long time, that's all our group did was uh, publish data and produced uh, charts and models of the magnetic field and made them available to the public. Now, the first observatories were pretty much on the coast or near the coast, uh, with one exception. Uh, but one was in Cheltenham, Maryland. Uh, Sitka, Alaska, Honolulu, Puerto Rico, Tucson. Tucson is a little more interior, but that's where it is. We now have 14 observatories, uh, and there are, I put down 100, but I think there's closer to 120 or more observatories worldwide. And every country has their own agency that takes care of this. Some countries, such as China and Russia, and a few others, may have multiple agencies, which means that they may have differing standards, which drives some people nuts. Uh, and just to give you an idea of what kind of a data record we have, this is a plot of the declination. It goes back to the start. Uh, one thing I forgot to mention is Cheltenham was in Maryland. It was replaced in the mid-50s by Fredericksburg, which is in Fredericksburg, Virginia, <coughs> because the site in Maryland was getting too noisy. Uh, there's a gap in the BSL data. That is Stennis Space Center in southern M Mississippi. And the gap is due to Hurricane Katrina. Uh, this is not the most current graph. There should be a couple more data points for at least 2020 and 2021. But, and you can see that at some of the northern latitudes, there have been significant changes in the, uh, mag in the declination over the years. I mean, when I first moved to uh, Fairbanks in 97, the declination there was about 25 degrees. Now it's on the order of 17 degrees. Uh, just so you know, DED on the 
right is our Dead Horse Observatory in Prudhoe Bay. We have one in Newport, Washington, Fresno, Tucson, Honolulu, Boulder. SHU is in the Shumigan Islands in Alaska. And SJG is San Juan. Uh, but that kind of illustrates the kind of a data record we have. And we really try and work to keep this data record going. And sometimes we got to sit there and really hammer on the powers that be in the various federal agencies to keep this going. Now, okay, now let's see if I can't do, the, there we go. Okay, we have online a page that shows geomagnetic plots from all of our observatories. Now, I'm not sure what's going on at Stennis Observatory, so I'm going to eliminate it from the plot. We just see the PowerPoint presentation. Oh, you're still seeing the PowerPoint. Oh, well, okay. Let's see if I can't change that. Okay, I stopped sharing. Let's go back to, oops. Uh, share it again. A window. And, oh, I don't want the software update notification. Well, maybe I'll have to show you that later. That plot, it's, it's, it's a place where you can look at real-time plots. And uh, so we'll skip that for right now. And at the end of the presentation, I'll show that to you. Anyway, when we started everything in the 1900s, all of our instruments were mechanical instruments. They had uh, magnets on quartz fibers and eventually epoxy fibers. And they could measure the torsion on all of that. Oh, are, are you still able to see this? Yes. Go ahead and maximize it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, here we go. How about that? Oh, crap. <laughs> I think it's page 28. We got there. Okay. Uh, we, everything, they were mechanical instruments. And, you know, like I said, they were magnets suspended on quartz fibers. They knew the torsion and all that stuff. And they had little mirrors on the fibers. And they'd uh, basically bounce a light beam off of the mirrors onto photographic paper. Hmm. And th those were the records at that time. They were photographic paper records and all the processing was done by hand by basically scaling the data or the amplitudes off of the graphs themselves and this is an example of you know the graphs on the left and they're kind of shrunk down and on but on the right we'd create these mean hourly value tables which was the mean for, say, the hour, zero to one, one to two, and so forth. And so back then, the data basically had a resolution of one hour. Now, since then, there's been a lot of equipment advances. Uh, in World War II, the Fluxgate magnetometer was developed initially for uh, to detect submarines. In the 50s, the proton, which is a nuclear magnetometer, where a processing proton, the frequency of a processing proton is proportional to the strength of the magnetic field. Uh, there's, a there's been a huge, as you know, a lot of us know, uh, increase in the use of digital computers and microchips you know, since then. Uh, USGS deployed their first digital system in 1975 and it allowed us to start producing data uh, that were one minute averages and you know s since then networking and the development of the internet has been a huge help because we can now pretty much log into our observatories remotely from golden that's where the office is and check on the system and uh, you know sometimes even reboot it 
although there are occasions when we have to get a local person to come in there and actually push the on off button to really get things restarted uh but originally we had one hour temporal resolution uh <clears throat> the first did the the first digital systems were you know had a little more resolution we are there right now they're in currently deploying a fifth generation system which has a re resolution a data resolution of a tenth of a second and you know the data are being recorded to essentially one pico tesla and most data are available for download via the internet now uh, there's several different places uh, this can be obtained but you know I, I mean even when I was when I started we were on our first or second generation system back in 88 and I've seen just all kinds of changes and it's just mind-boggling now the current data collection system uses what are called FPGAs field programmable gate arrays they're really not computers which uh, makes it a little easier to deal with IT uh, we can get real-time or near real-time transmission of our data we still get we have a flux gate amp magnetometer and it's oriented such we get such as such that we get the horizontal declination and vertical components of the field it uses an overhauser magnetometer which has an absolute accuracy of a tenth of a nano tesla uh, everything runs on 12 volts it's very low power consumption and uh, typically we've been using uh, you know a pair of car batteries that will keep the system running for several days or more and i know they're start starting to think about going with some of the bio enol batteries because while they're twice as expensive as some of you may know but they're also half the weight and if you've got to carry one or two batteries 400 feet across uh uncertain terrain that makes life a lot easier and everything is timed using a gps clock and so we have very precise time uh, and that's some. And a lot of this is what the rest of the world uses to one degree or another. And so, data that's recorded here, as opposed to Germany, using GPS timing, is pretty much time synchronous. Uh, now, we do have international partners. Uh, there is a group known as Intermagnet, uh, and it kind of stands for International Magnetic Observatory. It was founded in the late 80s and early 90s to basically uh, you know, get everybody together to promote real-time or near real-time data transmission and provide a set of standards uh, for data acquisition. We also participate in a much older organization known as the International Association of Geomagnetism and Aronomy took me three times to spell that properly. And I've got a hanging parenthesis, I see. <laughs> uh, we also have had cooperative programs with foreign observatories or uh, our counterparts in other countries. You know, I did my PhD research in the old Soviet Union and they put me up for three months and you know that was an adventure uh we had other newer stuff uh where sometimes we collaborate on some projects and things like that uh now the last thing i'm getting to are what are called activity indices or uh, and they were first developed gosh probably almost 100 years ago to characterize magnetic disturbances in the earth's magnetic field Primarily, they are based on the relative amplitude of, the ma of magnetic field variations. There are a whole lot of them. Some of them have lasted a long time. Others have popped up for five or ten years, and then, you know, they go away. But 
There are the K indices, KP, DST, which measures the store storm time, uh, equatorial electrojet current. There, AE is for the auroral electrojet, and there's AA. I can't remember what that is. It's a very old index that some people keep using. Now, <clears throat> one of the things I've seen in some of the books by ARRL, it talks about K indices and it refers to the K indices from Boulder. The thing is, the K indices are computed at the observatory using that observatory's data. Strictly, they don't represent any other part of the world. And it, 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 you know, when I was in working at the college observatory in Fairbanks, you know, we computed our indices. K indices a, you know, a little bit differently. Well, no, I shouldn't say a little bit differently, but they were, you know, they had uh, different values. And to compute them, we'd take a look at the daily curve and then we would <clears throat> estimate what was the quiet curve and subtract that from the data, leaving a disturbance curve. <clears throat> and then we would take a look at the H and D disturbances over three hour intervals, zero to three, three to six, so on and so forth. And the, uh, and then we would use those amplitudes and convert them using a quasi logarithmic scale to come up with the K values zero to nine. And the thing is, is that while, um, what might be a K of five in Boulder might represent 150 nanoteslas. At college, that same K value would correspond to 500 nanoteslas. And so that's why you got to be careful using the K indices and know where you're measuring them because what you get at one observatory may or may not correspond to what you get at another observatory. Now, one thing they did is they came up with the KP index or the planetary K index. And what it does is it averages the K indices from 13 different observatories uh, from the two hemispheres. Uh, the Sitka and Fredericksburg observatories uh, represent the USGS, but other observatories are in Germany, Australia, India, just to name a few. But it has two limitations. It has a time limitation of three hour intervals and they're not computed until after the three hour interval, which means that it's kind of almost a retrospective look, but it still has use, but it also has an upper limit and is not possible to, uh, Oh, I should say it's not possible to characterize magnetic disturbances above KP equals a little over about nine and a half. And it's difficult to get a current up-to-date index. Now, there are some people who have developed uh, software where they can kind of predict what they meet, might be for the next three to 12 to 36 hours, something like that. Uh, and, you know, the, the software is getting better. But the Germans uh, in Potsdam, Germany, it's part of GFZ. And don't ask me to pronounce that because I have no knowledge of German. But they developed two new indices in the last couple of years called HP30 and HP60. And they've got a slightly different name, but what they're doing is they're looking at the field at 30 and 60 minute intervals. And uh, I found out from a colleague in Germany just the other day that there are some hams in Finland who like the 30 minute index and it's used by some Finnish hams. Now, and GFC has a web page that basically now casts with the HP30. So what we're getting is a much more uh, 
up-to-date characterization or quantification, really, of the magnetic activity uh, going on. And so at this point, I'm going to ask, are there any questions? Uh, here are some links of interest. I can leave them up for a while, but I'd like to go to the, some of the web plots I have first. So we'll try that. But if you have questions, just shout out and let me know, and we'll see what I can do. Uh, a higher K index results in more noise on my S meter? That would be correct. Bill, I've got a question for you. Shoot. Um, have you seen on QRZ there, I think, are some folks in Canada who are, they've developed their own theory that earthquakes create disturbances in um, the ionosphere. And I don't know how scientific their data is, but um, it seems to be something that they sort of continually uh, bring up on the forums there. I was wondering if that seems at all plausible to you and if you have any thoughts on it. Well, uh, uh, earthquakes associated with the Earth's magnetic field have been a hot and cold topic for the last 25 years or so. Uh, it's sort of like catching a tiger by the tail. There has been a lot of evidence suggesting there's a correlation. But uh, one of my colleagues at USGS produced a number of papers back in oh, the early 2000s that basically disproved most of them. Uh, and so it's, I, you know, I, I, I've got to, I, it, to a sense, I've got to be neutral on them because I looked at some of the data in the 90s and it was kind of, it was iffy, and the thing was, is we could never generate funding to really do a thorough survey. The frustrating thing is, is there's been data from, uh, where you, uh, what do you call it, the uh, Russians that's never been released, where they have claimed to see some uh, correlations. Okay, well, that's interesting. Thanks. Uh, now, some of you should see, I, I hope you can see this web page now that shows the uh, real-time plots from the USGS. We can. Yep. 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 And the one, one thing, yeah, this shows them from all the observatories. Now, Barrow has a problem. I don't know if any of you heard, but last week, apparently one of the main trunk lines in western Alaska went down and it's going to take two to three months to fix. And so we're not getting from data, data from Barrow at the moment. Now we are from Dead Horse. Uh, but this is what it looks like. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to try and get rid of some of the other uh, observatories here. And I'm going to show you some of the more northern some, you know, college, that's, you know, yeah, I used to be the chief of the observatory there. And, you know, we go down to Boulder and I can sit here and what I can do is I can get rid of everything. And let's see, that's just Boulder for one component. And how do I get it for all the components? <laughs> but, you know, that's what the data looks like. Currently, um, oh, here we go. That's what I was looking for. Uh, this is the you know, this is up to date data from Boulder. Oh, uh, and we have two ways you can look at it. Uh, with from uh, oh, what do you call it? A regular where it shows you the data in X Y Z or for in operations you see it in H E Z. E is declination in nano Teslas, and you can see oops there was a spike in the delta f that is uh delta f is a very characteristic thing we use because 
from the fluxgate magnetometer, you can compute F and then compare it with the actual measurement F with the different magnetometer. And uh, it can be very diagnostic. One thing you can do with this page is you can zoom in, find out where that bad boy, ooh, I don't, I don't know what caused that. <laughs> But you can, uh, I mean, there's a lot of ways you can play with this page. Uh, you can look at all the different observatories. Uh, you can actually step back through time and see what the data looked like, you know, uh, hours ago. Uh, and, you know, you can see it for the past day, the past hour, or if you want to see what it looks like for the last uh, week. You can set it up and it'll show you what everything looked like over the previous week. And in this, you'll see that in some of the components, you'll actually see a daily variation and that's sort of the daily variation curve. Uh, we also monitor the temperatures to make sure the temperature control is good. Uh, the other web page I wanted to show you are the German ones. This is actually a now cast in the graph here of the HP30 index that they produce. Uh, and they, this is something that, you know, it's only about two years old, but they kind of show you uh, <coughs> a comparison of the various indexes, the HP30, the HP60, and the KP index. And you can see that with the, especially with the HP30, you can see, you know, a little more variation in how things look. Uh, they've got references about mm -hmm. this. There's a few papers you can uh, access in the website. Uh, the paper by Yamazaki et al. Uh, I've read it's very, it's a very interesting thing, but it's a little detailed, but if you feel like it, go for it. And so, um, what I'll do is I will find a way to get these slides to everybody, and uh, then you can go after some of the, uh, uh, what do you call it, um, uh, links that I've provided. Hey, Bill, this is yeah. Jeff Irvin. I was going to mention back in September of 21, we had a presentation by an Alex Schwartz with regard to his thoughts on RF seismograph. He seemed to think that there was a correlation. I don't know if you recall that presentation that he did. I don't recall it, but I know I've missed a handful of presentations because some Wednesday nights I just plain forget. <laughs> and I've got his slide deck if anybody's interested in seeing that. Uh, this is Dick, and I'm concerned about uh, field day coming up this weekend. Uh, this evening at eh, 5 p.m., uh, the the solar flux was like 170, K index was uh, one, and there was nobody to speak of on uh, 10 meters or 15 meters. Signals were weak or mm -hmm. non-existent. Is there another thing at play besides uh, solar flux and uh, K index? Uh, oh, there are a few, but I don't remember them off the top of my head. I did check the uh, NOAA site and their forecasts only go up to Friday evening, the 23rd. And so, you know, but tomorrow you can go to the NOAA page and find out what they predict for sat Saturday and sun, and then the day after that Sunday to get an yeah, idea. It, would that be the G uh, uh, measurement? Uh, well, yeah. the, G, the G measurement is a me measure of the strength of any magnetic storms. And, you know, really, we only need to be concerned with Gs of three or more. So they have R, S, and G. So R is really the radial thing is all we care about, isn't it? I think so, yeah. Okay. They predict a, a possibility of a weak storm, you know, and then a smaller possibility of a stronger mm -hmm. storm. Yeah. I hope everyone enjoyed this. I see the uh, uh, 
my number of people listening increased to 25 while I was online. So, you know. Hey, you know, since you have a PhD in this, they say that every 200,000 years, the poles flip. And then you mentioned that it was a dynamo in there somehow. Is it due to uh, well, something moving in the core? That's really out of my area expertise. Um, the, uh, the every 200,000 years is kind of the average but there have been periods where the pole has flipped after 50,000 years, and there's been other times where it's taken a million years to flip. And yeah, it's something that happens in the dynamo. Um, you know, there are some people who are worried that, that might happen in the next 10 or 15 years. I'm not worrying about it. Uh, and if, if it happens, life could get really exciting because we'll lose the protection of the magnetic field and you know everything could go to crap and you know it may be that those of us with radios may be able to communicate better than people who rely on cell or the cell phone radios <laughs> okay bill hey very interesting any other any other questions for bill before we uh mm -hmm. well uh, i believe jeff has put the uh the, the link in the uh, chat, if you're uh, inclined to uh, uh, go for the uh, the uh, uh, <laughs> the door prize, if you will, the drawing for the gift certificate uh, for for members. So, uh, uh, any any final questions for a bill? Interesting. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I see something popped up here. Was that you, Jeff? I think Darone put a YouTube link in there. Yeah, oh, okay. that was me. That was just for Bill's okay. presentation. I just saw it pop up on the screen. All righty. Well, how many we got in the uh, drawing there? Uh, well, let's see. They're streaming in. Hang on now. We've got 13, it looks like. 13. Okay. Well, we'll give you, anybody hasn't put their name in, go to the chat. We'll give you a. Uh, mm -hmm. just a half a minute or so here and we'll oh uh i do have one quick question who do i send uh my powerpoint presentation to uh you can you can certainly send it to me bill and i'll okay yeah, send it to wants jeff. It. yeah, yeah. Send it to jeff. I, uh, there's one problem on the very last page where one of the links is kind of fuzzed out and so i got to see if i can't fix that and then i'll send it to you all righty well good well anyway yeah, everybody don't interest, forget about Jerry, you want to spin it yeah sure don't everybody don't forget about our upcoming activities i won't go through all of them again but uh, uh come out to field day we had a straggler uh, yeah. okay yep. yeah right. well go ahead and spin it let's see who the the lucky winner is. Okay, it looks like our uh, winner tonight is uh, KF0FPI. KF0FPI, Mark uh, Evans. Okay. So what, what's the name with it? Moke Evans, M-O-A-K Evans. Okay. Welcome or Evans Moke, I'm not sure which. Well, there you are. Nope. Very good, guys. Thank you very much. Okay. Well, it'll, uh, are you, on all these. are you good in our roster or on uh, QRZ? Yes. Okay. So, uh. Yes, everything, everything. Yeah, I think I've been with you guys a couple of years and signed up for two more. So, well, great. We appreciate it. That's what keeps it going. Yeah, we sure need the membership. Thank you. So okay, Bill, with that, uh, Bill, can you uh, guarantee a, a quiet geomagnetic field for field day? If you want to guarantee, buy a toaster. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, uh, yeah. Uh, no okay. promises. Roll the dice and we'll see what happens. Yeah. I I mean, the weather's looking nice for a change. Oh, yeah. yeah. 
compared to last year. So, uh, mm -hmm. yep. All right, everybody. Well, it's about uh, five after or so, and we'll say seven three. Thanks for uh, joining up, Bill. Thanks for yeah, thank presentation. You. Very, uh, very interesting stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And if you have more questions, you can always ask me Saturday morning. All righty. Look forward to it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Bye. Okay. Well, good you. night, everybody. Thank you very much.